Okay, let me begin. Hi, so I'm, uh, or first I'd like to thank um, all of the organizers for allowing me to give this talk. My name is Anthony Munson. I am a PhD candidate in physics at the University of Maryland College Park. My advisor, it, my advisors are Nicole Younger Halpern and Christopher Jarzinski. And today I'll be talking about some follow up work to the uh, referenced um, uh, physical review uh, article below. And this was done in collaboration with um, the, the authors below. In particular, I'll be discussing how work trades off with complexity uh, in computationally restricted thermodynamics. So let's begin with a simple question. So in this problem, we're going to consider a, a system of n qubits initialized in an arbitrary known state rho. And we're going to make a simplifying assumption, namely that there will be no energy difference between each of the qubits zero and one states, um, which just implies that there's no energy difference between any n qubit states. Um, another way to say this is that we will be working with a completely degenerate Hamiltonian. Now, our goal is to reset the qubits to the all zero state, which we denote zero to the n. Now, the we care about this problem because in many practical situations, it's useful to initialize a system into a simple and easily manipulated state like the all zero tensor product state. So now let's talk about our solutions. We have a thermodynamic solution as well as a computational solution. So let's detail them in turn. Before we do, there's a middle way. And this talk is going to be about this middle way and its trade-offs. So first, let's talk about the thermodynamic solution. This is erasure. So we're going to perform, in this solution, we'll perform an erasure protocol with a fixed temperature heat bath. And there are many experimental realizations of erasure protocols, but uh, for this talk, all that we care about is that the erasure protocol maps every n qubit state to the all zero state. Importantly, we begin with a, a known state rho, which is in general, you know, a, a mixed um, a mixed state uh, represented by density operator. And even though we know the state, the erasure protocol doesn't really care. Um, so we don't use any of our knowledge about that state in the erasure protocol. It's kind of just like hunting. Now, according to Landau, we know that the protocol requires a work cost of at least n times kVt log two. And the reason we have this work cost is because the operation is irreversible. Now let's turn to our second solution, unitary gate-based computation. Here we begin with a universal set of two qubit unitaries, and we're going to create gate sequences of uh, drawing from that universal set. So you can think of the universal set as our building blocks, and then we're going to construct a, a unitary from each of those building blocks. And our goal is to begin with rho and then uncompute it to a state which is epsilon close to the all zero state. Importantly, this is a reversible process in contrast to the erasure we saw in the previous slide. Moreover, by our assumption that there are no energy differences between n qubit states, this solution will incur no work cost. Now we have a problem. If we're limited only to, in, in practical situations, we won't be able to apply an arbitrary number of gates. And often we're limited to some fixed number in our laboratories. And so if we say that that number is R, then we face complexity restrictions. Importantly, if R is too low, we may be unable to reset the qubits. So this leads us to the middle way in which we combine 
our solutions one and two in sequence. So we assume that as an agent, we have a complexity allowance R, and we first apply to rho a unitary of complexity at most R. And thereafter, we just finish the job with thermodynamic erasure using some fixed temperature heat bath. Now, the idea here is that ideally we can use complexity to offset the work cost incurred by the thermodynamic erasure. And so a trade off emerges. We notice that if we perform only thermodynamic erasure, well, complexity doesn't matter. In fact, no knowledge of our state row matters. And if we perform only unitary computation, then we just incur no work cost. So looking at these two extreme cases, it seems that with this middle way, there exists some work complexity trade-off. And it turns out that this trade-off is controlled by a quantity called the complexity entropy. Now, intuitively, the complexity entropy quantifies the state's apparent randomness to agents who can implement only limited complexity unitaries. The definition is given below, and let's dissect what it means. So you'll notice that we have a couple of parameter labels on the left, that's the R and the one minus epsilon. And to the right side, we have the logarithm of some optimized quantity, the trace of Q. So Q is a measurement operator. And I want you to think of the trace of Q as something like a, the reciprocal of a probability. And so the logarithm out front and the argument being the reciprocal of a probability, this is essentially like a surprisal that you'll see uh, a quantity and information theory that comes up often. And so what we're really doing is we're defining this entropy as maximizing some surprisal. Now we impose some restrictions, the first of which concerns complexity. So we ensure that our measurement operators and the optimization must be can be affected only with unitaries of complexity at most R. And second of all, we require that these measurement operators successfully identify our state rho with probability at least one minus epsilon. This is also to say that the type one error identifying rho is bounded by epsilon. So this comes for those who are familiar from the hypothesis testing entropy. Uh, and so really the entropy we've defined here is like a hypothesis testing entropy plus some explicit complexity restrictions. So to get some intuition, when rho is an n-qubit state, the complexity entropy ranges between zero and n log two. So the zero comes from the low complexity limit where we can uncompute rho very successfully. And the n log two comes from the high complexity limit where basically, even if rho is a pure state, we may not have enough complexity to treat it effectively as anything other than a maximum mixed state. So our main result is that for an agent who one has complexity allowance R, and two, applies a unitary such that rho is transformed into a state epsilon close to the all zero state, that the agent incurs a work cost, which is at least KT times the complexity entropy. So this looks familiar to the expression for Landauer's limit we noticed before, and that's because it indeed generalizes Landauer's limit. So in the case when the complexity entropy takes on its maximal value of n log two, we just recover Landauer's limit. And that corresponds to the case in which we were just performing erasure, which makes sense. 
in the case where we're able to leverage our knowledge of rho to uncompute it successfully, this bound will go lower in the case where we're able to completely do so and perform and get away with performing no erasure, then this just becomes a trivial bound of zero. So indeed, this shows that the complexity entropy really does quantify the trade-off described. And lastly, I want to note that the complexity entropy really is a general tool for quantifying optimal task efficiencies in set com complexity restricted quantum information and thermodynamics. And so in the follow-up work, um, the forthcoming work, me, my collaborators and I uh, are, are doing, we actually show that the complexity entropy not only quantifies this problem of data compression and thermodynamic erasure, but also in randomness extraction. And I invite the audience to use the complexity entropy to address all of your complexity restricted needs. Again, this work was done in collaboration with the following individuals, and it can be found uh, at the reference links below. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for this great uh, talk. Uh, we will have time for a few questions and then we will continue with the discussion. Uh, so first question, uh, Rui Cheng, uh, uh, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. I'm just wondering what is the time needed for performing a a thermodynamic oh a unitary computation protocol. Uh, I mean, you, you just mentioned that it is a reversible process. So, is that a quasi-static process? So you, you're you're talking about um, the time the... needed to perform a unitary computation. I see. I I don't know the. Um, yeah, you, you, so you're asking what what's a, a typical time in a laboratory to perform? A, yeah, yeah, yeah. A gate. I, I'm not. I'm not familiar with that. Um, I, I work okay. in an office with some experimentalists who um, oh, who know the answer. But yeah, um, you know, yeah. this is a finite time. You know, for Landau limit, there is a finite time correction. You know, which is proportional to one over tau. Tau is the time to perform the protocol. So, so I'm just wondering whether there is a correction if we consider finite time process. Oh, I, I see. So, so you're asking in the um, in, in the bound that I performed that there is a, a finite yeah. time correction for the application of unitary gates. Um, yeah, yeah I don't, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, and I wonder if that at all has has to do with um, this assumption about the completely degenerate Hamiltonian. Um, but yes, I, I don't have a, a good answer yeah, to that guess, question, although I'm, I'm think, uh, curious. Uh, I guess it may be an interesting question and deserve for further study, maybe. maybe Sorry, this, what was the last part? Maybe, maybe this will this deserve for further study this question. The time, you know, the correction to your bound, the fine time correction. Maybe yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, Todd, yeah. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Perhaps, thanks. Okay, thanks. So we have also uh, hands raised up. Uh, from, uh, if probably, uh, maybe uh, to read questions from the chat and then uh, you can uh, continue with your question. So the question from the chat is, uh, Rocky Keith, and what is the meaning of trace of an operator? Here, usually trace or uh, row being some expectation value, what does it uh, only operator trace mean? Um, da, 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 some expectation value. I see, I see. Um, so let me go back to the slide. Um, yes. So in this case, um, the the trace. So as I said before, um, it's best to think of this like the reciprocal of a probability, and I think this is why um, the 
the trace doesn't have a direct intuitive meaning in terms of you know expectation values and, and so on um, th that you you may be used to. Um, so perhaps to give intuition, we can think about the case in which we have no complexity at all, and um, the only the only qualifying uh, measurement operator we have is just the identity operator. So for a, a in qubit state, that'll just be um, an identity operator on um, a um, two to the n dimensional space. And so we, whenever we take the trace of that, we're going to get um, the, um, we're just going to get what two to the n, um, and then we take the logarithm of that. Um, so that that kind of gives you some intuition. Um, and then if you take the case of a, a pure, uh, just, if you take the case of a, um, measurement operator, which is just a, a projector onto, let's say, the all zero state, say that you actually succeed um, and, and you can implement that. Um, um, you, you can implement that, then you'll end up getting um, the trace of one, which. Um, it, so the logarithm will just be zero. Um, other than that, you might have to play with it a little bit. Um, but yeah, thinking about it as the reciprocal of a probability kind of helps out with this. And typically in quantum theory, we don't directly deal with such quantities. So it's it's not so apparent in this case. Um, one further comment is that um, this um, complexity entropy can be understood as um, a special case of uh, a complexity relative entropy, which we discuss in detail in the forthcoming work. And if you um, look um, and if you use the, if you start with the complexity relative entropy, um, then you'll see that we really have this trace of Q times this, um, a, a, an additional positive semi-definite operator. And in that case, perhaps this expression would make more sense to you as something like an expectation value. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I see this, uh... Yeah, Rocket nice out his hand uh, for uh, reply, but maybe first if we could uh, follow up the Tom's uh, questions. Yeah, so perhaps related to the previous question, is okay. there is is this result fundamentally quantum in nature, or is there a is there a obvious classical analog, for example, this? And this complexity entropy does it does yeah. it make sense in the context of a of a classical system? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, I, I think that you could encode a. I think it accommodates classical systems in the sense that you could encode the information of a classical system into a quantum state. Um, I, I do think that um, it's it is not irreducible to. Uh, classical um, case. Um, so really the complexity of a state is something which only makes much sense to discuss uh, meaningfully in, in, in the case of um, quantum states, because in classical states, if I just have zeros and ones, then okay, you're going to be able to, you know. Um, right, but there's, it. It, it feels like it's, somehow representing like a a program for generating that state right um uh, so it it draws from the um so, so it's inspired by the uh um, hypothesis testing entropy which can be understood through a semi-definite program so perhaps that's um the similarity that you're seeing um i'm not sure if that that answers your question oh i I know, but that's largely because I don't understand quantum stuff, which is why oh. <laughs> motivates my question. Got you. Uh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Maybe uh, I could read now one more question uh, from chat, and then uh, Rocket could also ask a question in person. So the question by Finn, uh, uh, isn't calculated HR the same complexity as the birth extraction itself? Sorry, one, one more time. <laughs> uh, so the question is written in the chat, the last message. Isn't calculating HR the same complexity as the work extraction itself? Um, I 
I'm not entirely so so I I don't see obvious reason why that would be the case um uh, I think it's clear from the definition of the complexity entropy that um th this complexity entropy or uh, 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 restriction that is given for the measurement operator um does make calculating this quantity um a a non-trivial task and so um perhaps there there is an interesting um question here whenever we actually calculate the um complexity entropy how how does that relate to the work of this process um one thing that i would say is that the um the work involved um in in the the middle way protocol is reliant upon a fixed temperature bath um, and the complexity entropy clearly uh, singles out to no such bath so I don't think that there's a direct relation between the two unless you make some additional assumptions about um, how you would calculate the complexity entropy using um something like like a bath or some other assumption that makes that uh that calculation of the complexity entropy uh, uh physically realized okay okay thank you so rocket you can ask uh, your question or give your reply uh thank you thank you for the opportunity uh, it's a really nice talk uh i got confused uh in one aspect so you said that if uh I am taking a measurement operator of the form of uh, identity in two to the power n. Then yes. uh, you are taking then you are taking the trace in that representation and you are getting a number. But suppose my measurement operator uh, or the operator that I'm considering is a traceless kind of operator. How would you take a log of zero in that case? Because I can take a Pauli kind of uh, generalized Pauli matrix kind of operator right I, I see yeah um so the um so perhaps this was um unfortunately hidden in the the term measurement operator so by assumption here the measurement operators are uh positive semi-definite operators um or I, I guess meaningfully positive uh, definite operators um so the the eigenvalues will be all positive or at least um, there will exist at least one positive uh, eigenvalue. And so whenever you, you take the trace of it, you're just going to get a sum of maybe some zeros, but then some positive numbers. And so the trace will always be some, some positive number. So I oh, think the, okay. yeah, does that answer it? Yeah, thanks. Right, great. Okay, thank you very much. So I think that we have a few more questions uh, to finish that. Uh, that were not answered. Before that, if I could ask uh, just one quick question to Anthony about the terminology. So we we, we take complexity entropy and the complexity and entropy are sometimes uh, considered uh, as different notions. Uh, you, in the present slide, you consider two limit cases. One is uh, low complexity, other one uh, is the uh, high complexity. Why do we call it uh, entropy? Why do we call it complexity? And I would, do we call it complexity entropy? Great. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the um, the the complexity part is coming really just from um, the the fact that the 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 entropy is taking explicit account of the complexity of a state. So consider the von Neumann entropy. If I take a pure state, no matter what its complexity is, uh, I'm still just going to have von Neumann entropy of zero. Um, and so um, the von Neumann entropy, along with other common entropies, often are dependent only on the spectrum of the state and so are insensitive to differences in complexity, which you know, tells us that to the degree to which you know, it'd be useful to have a, an entropy to, to quantify uh, these computationally restricted tasks. Um, we, we need to use an entropy which 
um, takes explicit account of, of the complexity. Um, and so the, the entropy we're, we're introducing really just um, as a means to um, you know, quantify optimal efficiencies uh, for, uh, for complexity restricted tasks, um, just much like, let's say, for example, the Shannon entropy is used to quantify the limits of data compression. And um, part of the intuition you get here is that we're we're looking at the state's apparent randomness, as I noted before. Um, and so that gives you some intuition and motivation for the why we're using the entropy. And then the, the complexity part is really just, um, uh, the, it comes from our, our need to actually account for complexity whenever we're talking about computationally restricted tasks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's very, very interesting uh, research in this way very interesting talk indeed. So I would suggest that, that we could uh, now read the, the question from the chat, uh, which was, do she need to start planting if it sense to work not, uh, this question was not answered. And this, uh, do you lose? Sorry if I'm not pronouncing uh, well the names. 